strategic vision combined with robust action can move mountains. And one person who has clearly made that happen is Rajendra Pawar. Raji realized early on that the capabilities of Indian youth, properly trained and skilled, could actually create a full industry. And he went around doing that. Over 40 million people have benefited from NIIT. We have also seen Raji in various roles as president of MATE, chairman of NASCOM, and an amazing speaker on national and international forums. Rightly, Raji was honored by the Padma Bhushan, by the president of India, and today builds NIIT University with the same passion that he always had. So hello again, and here we are meeting Mr. Rajendra Pawar, because Raji, as I love to call him, is the quintessential intellectual. He wants to get into the motivation of every human being. One of the reasons why I think he is clearly one of the leaders of our industry. And if we all take some credit for the $200 billion industry sector we are today, I think a lot of credit goes to Mr. Rajendra. So Raji, let's start by talking about you. Tell us, you know, what's your motivation? What's the background? What made you do what you did maybe early on with NIIT? So um, after IIT, it was the DCM management training scheme, the hot thing in the north. And then during that time, I got exposed to uh, um, that time called computers because DCM had, had the data products division and the management trainings were allocated based on the uh, acumen of the leaders, let me just call it for better, anything better. And they put us into a place. And I wanted to go to that part of the business, but that was not allowed. So I kept trying. And then the people who were running data products, Shiv Nada, Arjun, and so on, left to start their own company, which was first called Microcom, then became HCL. And they had asked me to join, but I couldn't join at that time for personal reasons. My father just retired, did gone to Jammu. I joined a year later when HCL Western India was being set up. So I therefore got the opportunity to get deep into the computer industry at its inception, 77. And so two years I was involved in setting up the region. And then I was a little more keen to get a slightly larger picture. So I talked to our chair and founder, Shiv Nader, and said, I want to do something which is more holistic. So he said, good, create a title and come to head office. So I called myself the corporate planning manager. Because we used to read about how all these big companies are letting the people choose titles. So the idea really was to okay, this to understand how we should develop as an organization, how we should respond, how we should create a market, but respond to it as well. So in that role, it was fascinating for me because it was about product development and market development and business development, the planning part of it. So it is during that time that I started looking as we do at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats and got the whole brilliant entrepreneurial team with CL to be in more and more workshops trying to think together because they're all doing their stuff and doing great jobs. But getting them together to think together was part of my role. During which time it started becoming clear to me that, you know, we, we had terrific R&D, there was going to be a market because it was happening elsewhere in the world. And uh, what would hold us back would be talent. So it was kind of occurring. Now, people have asked me that, is it that you have love for the people function and that's why you saw it or was it so obvious? And I don't know what the answer is truthfully. But I did find myself spending a lot of time with the training function of HCL who was bringing these very bright MBAs and engineers and spending time with them to get their mind to open up about the possibilities and so on. So that in many ways, when I've tried to look back at what do I enjoy the most and that question has been asked a hundred times and I finally found a very simple answer, Ganesh. Uh, and it's not about the logic of it. I think it's ultimately all of us are driven by something which we call emotion because we can't pinpoint it. So to me, seeing people grow gives me great joy is how I'll capture it. And I'm fortunate that the people who kind of assembled in the beginning and then of course systematically perhaps we were looking for this without listing it like this, people who love to see people grow, was the core team that got created. And then we were at that time in HCL. This is now still in HCL, but the idea was not born yet. The idea was talent, shortage of talent, how to build. And therefore, why not look at that as an opportunity? It was a constraint. 
we said, let's make it an opportunity. So this is how the genesis was born, uh, was the, the, the idea, of the, the genesis of the idea, to do stuff about building talent, or helping people grow. So that's the, the very genesis, and that has shaped our thinking quite a bit over a period of time. But Raji, at that time, I mean, we were just talking in an earlier conversation with Harish Mehta on in the role that Mr. F.C. Kohli played. And we both agreed that obviously what FCK saw was the immense talent of IITNs, BTECs, MTECs, their potential to be in the US. Whereas but when you started NIIT, it was clearly to enable young people, not necessarily going to the IITs or anywhere, but young people from literally any discipline to aspire to building technology careers. So how did that strike you? So uh, when I was uh, setting up the Western India operations of HCL, were the days when we were hiring MBAs. I, in fact, Bombay, in Bombay, I got 14 MBAs from the IIMs joining my team in the business development team. And uh, so you could get this talent. But then when we started looking at how to grow the business and how will the customers, who are all kinds of customers that time for the HCL, HC and DCM machines and so on, they were big companies, but they also they were also enterprising young mid-sized business people. So the idea then was that if they have to run a computer, they have to buy computers, they're willing to buy, but who will run it for them? These MBAs are not going to go there. They will they, they will want to be at the cutting edge of creation, creation of market and so on. So then it started becoming clear as I was doing that function that we would need a very much larger number of people than are produced by the top institutions. And second, these top institution guys will not want to do that job. So we'll need, we'll need skills versus what I would call as caliber or intellect alone. Now, we had also started formulating this idea that you don't need to be a maths guy to do program that we have learned even intuitively we have figured it out. So we said, now let's approach bright young people and help them understand programming as soon as they're in final year. So we started at that end in the beginning. And it took us a little while to realize that because when we launched NIIT, the ad was, if you have a college degree and no job, this ad can change your life. And in a couple of years, we discovered that the guy who's from college and has finished and not got a job, is he the kind of guy you want to get? So and it took one young, I am Calcutta guy to conclude that. And he said, look, We've got to go upstream because after tough schooling, you come into college in those days, you had a lot of time. So we said, why don't we go to first years? They have time on their hands and they, we will attract them because they're the bright ones. That made a very big change. It was a big change for us uh, to just alter the whole approach and say, go into colleges, talk to them, say, come and try this new stuff. So that became the method then to start attracting people. Then we morphed our, our offerings quite, quite a lot. So it became dual qualification. Then as you remember, you were so actively involved, which means you're doing a college side by side to do this by the time you finish. And then we developed that idea and we created a product called GNIT in 1991, 10 years in, where we said you're, you spend three years in college if you're doing whatever. And we had proved by then that whether you've done arts or liberal arts or whatever, if you have the aptitude, will make you into a top-notch professional. And there's evidence of that now. The yeah, other big advantage, I think, or the other, other big plus that was created. And so that got us, basically, that got us to go beyond the typical expectation of what should a, what should a programmer have. And when we broad-based it, we saw a very vast amount of interest. And then we said, now, how do we expand? And we didn't want to create a hierarchy of managers and leaders and lose the cutting edge. We had to be in touch with the market. And that's when we thought of the franchising idea. Mm, yeah, exactly. So that's when I was going. I think the big advantage was that not only in the prime cities, but even today, we are already talking about redistribution of jobs, which is good for the country. And even Prime Minister Modi recently at the NASCOM summit talked about the National Optic Fiber Network and creating opportunities all over the country. But I think the computer education industry were early pilots, as you rightly said, through a franchise model and expanding. Literally, you had multiple cities which would probably not have aspired to produce the kind of talent that was originally required. And they started believing. So it's like almost like the dream was everywhere. So how do you think that happened? Was it through clever advertising, through word of mouth, or you know, what really made that 
that dream becomes so omnipresent in every indian's mind see we all like to well all successful people if you call many of us successful uh, are questioned by media in those days in a line of thinking and they make you a bigger hero than you are i have to say that and what actually happened and what people will write tends to be different and in retrospect you fit in and say this is what was happening just like i said you know you know give me joy that was not why i got it that i discovered that so like that i think in many successful operations you have to go back and see what were you thinking what was driving it so if i to answer this question what we discovered was that there were college going students who were who were becoming outstanding at doing this thing which didn't correlate with their marks or background or how good they were in english language or whatever so that was opening up the whole idea that if there is this reality then why don't we go a little deeper so we took nine cities to start with they were again lucknows of the world they were not small pune and dawal we said we'll go there but as i said we didn't want to have managers and layers of managers because you'd lose touch with the market that was a firm belief so we said now who should we set up there and we thought of this idea that we will look for well educated people from good families who are coming to the big metros to get a job and the family want them to come back they are little sitting in you know, they have rented a little room barsati in delhi as we call it or pg in bombay and you know it's just kind of managing a difficult life but working well and we said if among them are the entrepreneurial ones and this is a very important thing which assumption which went out well we said if we give them the keys to our brand and they are the ones who are our front in the office in the front face face of the brand then they should adhere to our passion for good quality so we said okay now if there's a family which is a respected family in a city and they have a bright son or daughter but mostly sons second round third round lot of daughters also came we said if he is going to build an nit center there then the family will not let him compromise on standard they have a reputation to keep that was a very important factor for us it it came out very well so we had these people who by their upbringing and by the social context within which they operated had to prove themselves and wouldn't cut corners this was very important for us because we had to get the processes and practices in place but then we have also have to acknowledge i was beginning by saying that you know success um is always attributed to an individual but let's realize that many accidents in life happened so rajiv gandhi arrived on the scene okay and he had his computer cowboys if you remember okay played a big role very big role liberalization happened there were many of these things which were not of our creation but it's correct that the space was opened up and we were there to go with the flow so 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 computers were in the air at that time so everybody every every big company executive everyone who was traveling abroad they knew something is happening so there was a huge amount of headroom which gave us the space we only had to be nimble and careful that we grow well and we fulfill an obligation and you commit an honor commitment that was very key for us continues to be to this day that we will honor every commitment we make and we'll choose people who enjoy doing this so a lot of the reach in ganesh was a response coming but we had to cater to that response and these people were coming from small town to bigger towns to metros and just flying with the jobs that came so it's, it fueled itself quite a bit in which case but that that's the question i want to follow up with saying that i mean it's almost like the chicken and egg story so here we were building a great industry and resources were becoming available in abundance so do you think the availability of resources from computer training from then the bcas and mcas the ongoing supply of good talent and of course the desire of almost every individual to be part of the information technology sector is that what fueled the industry or was it the entrepreneurial excellence of the narayan murtis and fc kohli's and and shivnaders which actually created the demand first and then the supply for where do you think well it goes hand in hand i think it's that's why you know it's easier to say this or that mm-hmm. but the answer is never this or that ganesh you know that the answer is a bit of both in the middle pass you know 
So Buddha was right at the middle path. So it's a bit of this and a bit of that. If you don't have a favorable, favorable circumstance, however good you are as an entrepreneur, and we see that, we've seen the ups and downs. On the same hand, however bright you are as an entrepreneur, but if the wind isn't blowing in your face. So when you get this perfect match, then first thing which happens is that it's a favorable atmosphere. And some people are path breakers, they come and leverage it. But there's a dominant need there. There's an underlying dormant need. You have to tap into that. So look at all the explosive areas. There was an unmet need which was scalable. So in this case, it was you know, the fact that how to man use information to manage things better was the unmet need. And computers arrived, people had seen examples. And therefore, then there were people like Shivnadas of the world who already had, had the chance to work with a programmable calculator in HCL, which was going only to research establishments. So it's a four-bit microcomputer. That was only scientific calculation. Then they thought of saying, okay, now this thing is coming small businesses. So the first time a computer was advertised in price, 83,500, I remember, full page ad of the HCL, HC, microcomputer, 8-bit computer. And that was to tap into the potential which we were, we were beginning to see in people wanting to manage their systems through information. So that exploded more and more demand. And then you have more and more people sitting on the sideline to say, I also want to jump in. So the gold rush phenomena. So it needs both things. It needs both things in ample measure to happen. But then you have to pick and choose. Just to shift tracks a little. I mean, just tell us a little bit about your own views on the how the industry is evolved. I mean, today we are doing this program because we genuinely believe that in the making of modern India, the IT sector has played a role which possibly no other sector has played till date because we really have built global market share. We have a reputation. I still remember the good old days when people didn't recognize India for anything much except maybe mystics and what have you. And I was pleasantly surprised. I think it was in the early 90s when I was on a trip with my wife, Umar, to Alaska. And on the way back, we kind of took a little boat from the main ship to an island called Ketchikan and met a boatman there. And he looks at me and he realizes I'm Indian. And he says, oh, computer. I was like so proud saying that here is one industry which is now recognized in a remote island of Alaska. So if you look at it, tell me a little bit about how do you think this evolved? I mean, how busy, was it just that, okay, IT services and then somebody found a collateral opportunity in BPO and engineering services? How do you think the industry evolved? And as we were discussing, I mean, how, does the, how did the availability of manpower kept happening as to fuel the growth in the industry. So again, let's just first be grateful for the uh, factors in the environment. I talked about Rajiv Gandhi arriving. I talked about the liberalization. And along with liberalization, two things happened. Very importantly, the dot-com and the Y2K. These two were such a pro propellant to our growth. And if we disregard these, we'll be fooling ourselves. So very favorable environment, a set of people who are adventurous. And then they try. And they're very well-educated people. They're smart people. And they are now you know, traveling extensively in the Western world where customers are. And they're giving them solutions which are as good or more reliable at a fraction of the cost. That was the beginning. Okay, So that arbitrage was a very important fuel as well. But the good thing is we didn't lose it by trying to cream, cream up immediately. Those were, I think, sensible decisions to look at the scale, much like digital transformation at this time is the next big window. And it's bigger than Y2K, much, much bigger. So this is a window where everybody in the world has to change. So I think we seized that, we worked on that opportunity, and uh, then we, we, I think, collaborated. So so much has been talked about NASCOM and Kiran Karnak has written a book of you know, the, the unusual phenomena of collaborating while competing. Okay, it's a case study. People talk about it. But that actually plays to the nature of the people who came in. We have to say that. They were not opportunists in that sense. They were not working by taking shortcuts. They, were, they recognized, they all recognized that there was a big opportunity, but you got to do it right. And therefore, we started looking at standards. We started looking at ISO. We started looking at SCI. That those were very conscious efforts which said that we have an opportunity. We shouldn't make a mistake. It's scalable. So I think there we have to give credit to how the leaders 
thought and how they collaborated. That was conscious effort that no one told us to do. And we were all trying to learn from each other. We were all trying to do common sessions. And so that collaboration element, which created the DNA to go after the opportunity, which was call it body shopping, which I think was, I'm proud that we did that because I remember, and you may recall, Ganesh, uh, Edward Jordan, the great guru of software engineering, we used to call him to come and lecture for us, for our customers, to DCS and everybody else. And he wrote a book up in which he talked about India. And there he, because I was in discussion with him to say, look, how do we get to products? He says, don't be in a hurry. Even we didn't do it like that. You have to go through a process of evolution. Your people have to build the experience of doing the same thing so many times over that you know how to specify a product that doesn't come from a classroom. So he, 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 said, he said this uh, quite early on, 84, 85, he says, you'll have to give yourself time. Products don't happen overnight. Now we are seeing last few years, a huge explosion in that. And I think the bigger explosion in front, front of us, Ganesh, where I think we'll seize the opportunities in digital transformation, which is a superior thing. It's now taking anybody's product, can, taking anybody's services, but now helping organization change. So this transition has been steady, gradual, measured, I would say, but very creatively leveraged by our team, so by our people. Well, you're right, but, but for many of the households who are watching this program, Rajiv, and they would all be wondering, because I keep getting calls even today saying, okay, my son is now 21 years old, what should he do? Because people are constantly being told that the programming era is over. But I mean, to just paraphrase what you said, we started off by low-cost programming from India, we moved to low-cost programming, maybe from uh, from India itself, not just sending people abroad, including what you just mentioned. The SAIC and other places and... like China, we looked at all other places as well. Yes, so that no, model. Yeah. But I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of adjacencies there. I mean, from programming in America to programming in India to the Y2K, which was the whole software bug fixing to migration to implementing enterprise resource planning products. But suddenly we are finding that automation has come in, artificial intelligence has come in, the traditional testing programming jobs are going away. And of course, NASCOM has done this huge research on the future of jobs. But do you think our young people who are still in traditional, maybe engineering colleges and other training institutions, are they prepared for the kind of future that they will have to face? Where the future is maybe animation and storytelling and so many new skills. Do you think we'll conquer this also? The way we kind of move from one capability to the other over the last 30 years? In some ways, I think we'll do better at this one because you remember the days of programming. It still was hard work of a certain type, right? Here, actually, if you are well-rounded as a person, because everybody is a you know artist of sorts. Everybody has we are born with many skills. You have to sharpen. So now, what we are looking for is a more comprehensive view of a problem, right? And this is where I think, to me, you know, what we take for granted is we have about twenty-one official languages. Right? We just don't comprehend how it makes it possible for us to get non-verbal cues. In a typical house, well-to-do house, there'll be a maid who comes from Bihar and a driver who comes from UP and children grow up listening to them. So the typical, so when we talk of argumentative Indian or you listen to a TV with that eight people speaking at the same time, which other country can a guy, in the US they'll say, listen to one guy at a time. You've seen the cues, right? We try and beat the queue and the lady also talking to the third person in the queue in India. They'll say, sir, sir, please stop this. I'm talking to this person. So multi-processing is part of this multi-language phenomenon. And the fact that we are a very noisy place, you know, argumentative Indian. These are all very real phenomena of thousands of years of evolution. So the Indian mind, the Indian mind is a very versatile mind. It is a very versatile mind. And I think therefore it addresses problems and looks at them comprehensively. Whereas programming was not that, but programming was basically our ability to, to do math very well. And it's a fact, we do math very well. We may score very little, but compared to the rest of the world, look at us, look at Vietnam, look at Korea, some of these places. So the education system with all its warts builds a mind which was very good for programming. And now I feel that the Indian mind is at work, which is a more holistic mind, which is a more questioning mind, which is a more uh, sensitive mind, I would say, very often. 
and you lived in a joint family, you have 100 pushes and pulls going on. So you have to learn to cope. Life gets you to learn. I mean, you walk through the streets of Varanasi to see how to survive. You know, bicycle coming, a motorbike coming. I mean, no outsider can handle that. So I think there are many things built into the Indian system. And on top of it all, on top of it all is the demographic dividend. That there's an age group, there's a bulge coming and that you can see country after country. When that bulge came, the country had growth because that many young energetic people wanting to do something. You just have to engage them. So we have that bulge for the next many years. China's beginning to tail off. So this collective energy with reasonable education, with a rich mindset, and then in the middle of it, if we can do the NIT type stories, which are happening more and more, I mean, we created, out of nothing, we created a whole lot of an industry. And I see no reason why that wouldn't happen in similar areas. So we are an entrepreneurial people who cope with difficulties. So to me, I think for young people, the faith is whatever you're learning, whatever you're doing, work hard at it. What will come handy and not handy, nobody can predict. But Raji, do you then believe that this is the opportunity for small town India, even rural India, to join the party? I'll tell you why. Because, I mean, if you go to Japan, and I've been going to Japan almost twice a year for the last 15 years, you find that nobody really wants to be in IT. Okay, gaming, animation, it's all lovely, great fun. Online gaming is the thing in Japan and China. But nobody wants to be a program. Whereas here, if you look at our own country, we are finding that even today people want to be but again, if you look at the very affluent families in large cities, the children are either studying abroad or they are not particularly keen on being in a repetitive function. So, do you think it's an opportunity, especially as we talked about the National Optic Fiber Network and whole of India becoming fully digital with you know, with large Mbps bandwidth? Do you think this is a time for the next few millions of people? I mean, today we're proud of four and a half million people in the sector. Maybe the next ten million will come from small town India. I absolutely firmly believe that. See, I also learned something about TCS over the years. And look at the leaders they've created over the last few years. They come from small towns, from small engineering colleges. So TCS has found the formula to assess talent for its potential. They have a huge talent pipeline. And they're not the IITs. It's not that they don't take, now they're differentiating and whatever else, but the large workforce comes from a reasonable part of the interiors of India. That was Mr. Kohli's genius, truly speaking, right? Not that you go to the top institution, pay the top dollar and then that's it. So now, of course, like you're rightly saying, I firmly believe that if we have the fiber optic cable with reliable power and a tablet in somebody's hand, so it's a massive opportunity. It's truly a massive opportunity. I think that's really what we, as as NASCOM as well, are now thinking about. And is so, it also going to be further accelerated by you know this whole work from home phenomenon? I was, I, I mean, I, I remember talking to an industry CEO who said that now now everybody's home is an office. Yeah. So potentially, if everybody's home is an office, it could be anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. And so long as they have reasonable bandwidth, anything is possible. You could probably look at a 10x multiplication of this industry purely by broad basing the whole revenue. Absolutely, because the demand for digital uh, transformation is in every section of society in every part of the world. What we are looking at is a much, 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 much bigger opportunity now. So that's on the sub demand side. On the supply side, we also have the biggest opportunity with, with the young population, and which has been not, which hasn't been touched so far. So the question really is: you can't take a first, second class child in a village and give him and say, now you learn programming. That won't do it. They have to get education. So it will be about education first for the child. And therefore, can we give them basic education, whatever basic education means in the new context, and not about fast-tracking a child to programming. I'm not a believer of that. I think you will do, you will you'll make them too monochromatic. So give them better education at the last mile. And the very bright ones will move faster they will take too many of these things like fish to water. So you create the opportunities for many of the very bright ones who otherwise don't even get the opportunity. That's, I think, the real contributor. So you're opening up on the demand side. In any case, it's happening, and you're now opening up on the supply side. So this, I think, the role of entrepreneurs now is to do this matching, like we did first time around by building our talent-building organizations. Not that the NIITs 
NITs, IITs didn't produce, they were all, but the demand was huge. We are into a similar zone now. And so therefore connecting to the last mile, taking education there, then on top of that riding the waves of assessing talent for different sectors, whatever the sectors are, it doesn't have to be programming, it'll be much more than that. There's so much to happen with data. So finally, Raji, one last question, which is, I mean, if you look at the future, I mean, we all we talked about the past way, as you said, the symbiotic relationship between industry demand, India and abroad, as well as the fact that we could supply virtually meet any demand. So if you look at the future and you really look at maybe the 16 year old who is looking at the industry, looking at people like you with stars in their eyes, what should they be looking at? I mean, should they be building a career in this area? Should they be entrepreneurs? I mean, there is this big move to say that everybody possible do a startup. So where would you, with your wisdom point of view, look at the future and say that, look, if you have 300 million new job entrants over the many next decade or so, what should they be looking at? Including in other professions, not just IT. So what is what one thing is what should they look at? Other is what should the people who can create these new constructs of connecting this big demand with this big supply? This is a big opportunity, and this is a larger structuring that is needed by slightly more experienced people, because then you make a field of play where the youngsters come in with a field of play. What did we do with our NIT centers? We excited people and they enjoyed what they did. So I think it will be driven by people, uh, by their passion. And very often you don't quite know what driving you till you have arrived the other side, other side of the you jump into the river and then you arrive somewhere else. Right? So, but these two set of activities, there will be those who go deeper and deeper. The kid who's very curious to go into the detail will build an algorithm. Someone who's trying to do join dots We'll do something else. These are different minds. So force-fitting, that is not a good idea. I think we just have to create the... More and more people should be busy creating the structures, the enabling mechanisms, and, uh, you know, working on the demand side, working on the supply side. And youngsters will find their way. I remember Professor Mitra, I don't want to give the story, when he became our advisor after he retired from Bitspilani. He, he told me something. He, he said, uh, you know, the students in college who come and do a course when they are doing their education. So do you think you are the entrepreneur or he is the entrepreneur? He is joining up two things. So open my eyes. So the entrepreneur was a little kid who saw problems and constraints. And he took the NIT thing in addition to his college thing because he wanted to join things up. So therefore, we put our faith in the young people. But we do things which are enablers in a sense. We do enablers. We do policy enablers. Like now, as you know, our past chairman, Chairman's Council of NASCOM, is currently thinking of what should we do for India, not what should we do for the sector. We have a very powerful executive council which is saying, how do we go to the industry? But all of us who've done that before are now saying, okay, this, you know, India is at a stage where information has to do many more things for many more sectors, global, Indian, and so on. So that's the India opportunity of how to engage a much la larger number of young people to do productive tasks. No, but so, I think what you said is also so yeah. important because I remember, I mean, there are many famous quotes, uh, quotes from Steve Jobs. But one of my favorites is that he said in his usual style that you can never trust the customer to know what she wants. I mean, which is a complete contradiction of you know, knowing the demand first and then managing supply. So you're saying there are clear pathways in both. There is an entrepreneur who has this dream, you create the algorithm, create a product which is I mean, completely product category breaking like you did with an IIT so many years back. Or as you rightly said, could really map out demand, a good MBA would do and build supply to match that. And you're saying there's an opportunity for both. Yeah, yeah there's an opportunity for all. I think that's the important thing. I think you made a very important point, Ganesh, because everybody wants to be somebody else. I think that's the mistake parents do with good intention. Okay, Correct. that's the mistake many youngsters do with good intention. Everybody's doing it. So, how to create these uh, situations and opportunities and platforms, really speaking? How to create platforms which enable young people to get on? Many, many trains, many, many platforms. And but to let them know that, so we, when you, it, you know, it's all of us say, follow your passion, not easy. You don't know what your passion is. <laughs> right. So, but to give them the confidence 
I think to give young people the confidence that there are many different paths. Many different paths. So keep navigating what you enjoy. You'll, you'll go very fast. Basically. Hey, thank you very much, Rajiv. Always a pleasure talking to you.